Friday night. Why is it? Why is it expanding? Because it's finite. I think it's beyond us. No, no, no. The universe is finite. It's, is the universe finite or infinite? Because if you look at the cosmic background radiation, that indicates that once the, the universe was dense and it was hot. So the cosmic background radiation, we have readings of that. Um, and the fact, of course, there's something called redshift. There's enough kind of strong evidence to suggest that the universe is indeed expanding and it was once a hot, dense kind of uh, thing. Have you got coffee in there? Okay, I don't, I don't want you to get burnt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, if obviously it's expanding, and you reverse that time, it comes to a kind of point from which it came from. So a lot of scientists, I think the most prevalent theory today in science it is the Big Bang Theory. That's the best. The steady state theory is it's, it's, it's like kind of going against the tide sort of thing. So what do you think about cosmic background radiation? The fact no idea. I mean, there's so many people here today and it's, everybody's arguing their point about different types of our religion. Not necessarily it's better, but there always seems to be... Um, no, he didn't say this, he said that. And it, what I believe about in the Bible, I'm not really... I'm like that with the Bible as well, because I, the Bible for me was written well over 2,000 years ago by a man who I think put in what they wanted to put in, because they could do that. That's why I was saying earlier, the, the stories of Mary Magdalene supposed to be married to Jesus barely gets a right in the Bible, because if you think back 2,000 years ago, we've, just, we've even got men's claps now, so 2,000 years ago, women really didn't get a say, so I, I sort of scratch my head. Everybody quotes from the Bible, but I don't believe necessarily that's what happened. I, I love watching programs like this, or it's a program about um, crucifixion, these archaeologists, and I can't remember the Roman... Uh, Roman chap who turned to Christianity, he had a dream and it was just a cross. But when they looked into this, I'm sort of going off track here, but when they looked into it, and there was some very old um, buildings that we found, and they had a cross like this, it was a cross, like an X, not a cross as we know it. And they said that to be crucified, they have to be very efficient. And to have an actually cross, it wouldn't have happened because by the time that the, this Roman general discovered that he wanted to embrace Christianity, it was 300 years before the last crucifixion. And people would go like, well, I can't remember how they did it, but he had a dream about a cross. And this is what, this was just a documentary. So they said when you were crucified, it was by an egg very quickly, and it, it worked the same. And it, you would never have been crucified with your hands like this. You would have been crucified like that, because it's more painful. And the way that it goes in, it would have gone to your wrist, and not your hands. Right. So there's, you know when you see every single thing in a church, it's to his wrist. So, uh, there's a lot lost. We, we don't really know. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Sorry, what's your name? Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. So, Gordon, let's just have a... I'm not... I'm, 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 don't look at me. We're having like, a nice I conversation. I know what I'm talking about. I just... Like, it's like you said, when it comes to speakers, Connor, everyone is kind of giving their points. Yeah. And how do you analyze those points? Yeah. By the veracity. By, by rationality, by logic, by common sense. I'm like sort of open mind. So, let me ask you something. Hypothetically, let's just say you were to Islam. For you to say, you know what? Islam is the religion. That's met this criteria, no other religion. List me that criteria. So, so, yeah. um, so if there was Christianity, Buddhism, or all these... Yeah. Well, I don't think Buddhism is a religion, but... I couldn't really it's because it would, have to, it would have to come to me. I couldn't. Well, I would choose it, but it would have to be. I it would probably take a, a year or two years. What I, what I mean is, let's just say fast forward. Yeah. A year's taken. <laughs> And then you, you're, you're in the park or we're having coffee somewhere yeah. and you said, you know what, Islam is the religion. And then I ask you, how, how did you arrive to this point? Yeah. What would you tell me? What boxes needed to be ticked that have been ticked? 
It's not for the French, it's not for the Greeks, it's not for the English. From my point of view, like, because you've got to be sincere, Gordon, isn't it? If you're claiming to find the truth... But, 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 well, that's me being open-minded, so from my point of view, I, I, again, I don't like, I'm not going to follow a religion. Maybe, maybe there's a bit of Buddhism in me, because I believe that everything has a right to live. Everything, no matter what it does or whatever, um, everything's got a right to live, and you should believe that, at least. But I, I just generally try and be nice to people. And I think you get so many hypocrites who study religion, different religions, and I can't stand the hypocrisy of it, basically. Um, that's maybe put a lot of people off. I, I agree. I mean, a, a sensible individual or somebody, I think nowadays, for you to be considered wise, I would say you have to adopt the philosophy, which is you don't judge the religion by the adherence of the religion. Because if you do that, then even bus drivers, even you know cashiers, everybody, you know, there'll be an issue with, with, with somebody with every religion. So you have to come back to something objective. Logic, rationality, reason. So I guess what I'm saying to you is, logically, what would you say the criteria needs to be for you to go, you know what, it's Islam? Because in terms of implementation, I agree with you. There's all sorts of people and people pulling you in different directions. But let's just say we strip that to the side and then we say, okay, rationality, what would you say, yes? Would the concept of God in Islam need to make sense? Well, that's another topic. Do you, top of my head. Would you agree that the concept of God foremost needs to make sense? You can't say, oh, God is a rat, someone stepped on it, and that's the end of it. No. You'd say that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. The concept of God has to be such that it, your heart and your mind is in tune with it, sync with it. So it tells you that God is the most perfect being, the most absolute being who is self sufficient, who is independent who is not in any need, perfect. You will say, that seems to be the concept of God that I can accept, not a God who is deficient, imperfect, limited, weak, because that cannot be God, because the creator of this universe, this magnificent universe, That's fine. That's fine. the magnificent universe has to be created by someone who is so powerful. And now if I give an example of someone who is weak, how can you even say that? So it has to make sense. It also has to be a concept in which there is one absolute originator of this universe, not two. Because if there are two, there will be a conflict of will and there will be chaos and ruin of this universe. If there are more than one absolute creator of our universe, what's going to happen? Well, can I ask you a question? When did you, as a child, you were, you had been studying um, you were a Muslim? Born as a Muslim, yes. Yeah. Everyone is born in a, either a Muslim or in a state of disposition of what we call fitrah. It is their parents, the environment that makes them Jews, Christians, fire worshippers and so on. But every child is born in a state of this natural disposition in which they are already aligned with worshipping a higher being. They're already, the heart is already, uh, they're hardwired, yeah. if I want to use this word. So if a child is left alone, without anyone indoctrinated them, they will have this belief there is uh, someone creator up there who created all of these things. You don't have to teach them. It's there already programmed, hardwired. Well, so I was born, of course, yeah. I was born in a Muslim family. Yeah. Some people may not be in a Muslim family, which you know, indoctrinates and changes their belief system. But it came to a point where we are discussing with other fellow human beings with different ideas and belief systems, different theologies. So you can't simply then stick blindly to your faith and say, I'm going to follow my forefathers. My belief in a scripture called the Quran tells me that this approach is wrong because it says those people who follow and say, I am going to stick to and follow my forefathers. The Quran says, what if they are wrong? Yeah. What if they were wrong? So critical thinking is something that is really encouraged in Islam to use the intellect. And the example I gave you earlier on, look at all this magnificent assembly and so on. It cannot be a product of nothingness because nothingness itself does not have self-awareness, doesn't exist. 
how can it make something? But that, that's a belief, whether it be evolution, I don't know. No, before evolution, I, before evolution, yeah. if something yeah, exists now, true. let's try to understand one, one, one thing only. If something like you and I exist, could there be a time in the past there was absolute nothingness, where there was nothing, no energy, nothing? No, there's never been that, I don't know. Is it possible that there was something like that, where there was nothing, and then something came? No, that's going back millions of years now. So Go, it doesn't matter how many millions and billions and zillions and trillions and quadrillions and, and Googleplex years you want, right? I don't even know what the biggest number is, right? The fact is, nothingness cannot make anything. It doesn't have existence. So, something existing now means something has to exist always. Now, here is the problem with this. Something existing always, with no beginning. What is that something? Because something has to exist always. That something cannot be given properties attributes or qualities or characteristics by something else because there was no something else this thing existed always without a beginning so it must possess attributes and qualities inherently by itself for example energy or power it possesses no one gave it the originator would inherently by itself possess energy or power would also will possess a will because from this no beginning entity, we came with all this differentiation. Differentiation can only happen if someone wills it to make it different like that. You choose it to be like this, this tall, that short, and so on and so forth. This choice was involved to make something like this in these differences. If there is a will involved, I mean this is a conscious entity with a choice. Now, you know what we're getting at already? We are already affirming, without going into any religious scripture, that there is an originator of our universe. He not only possesses energy and power, but also is self-aware and has a will, and also must possess wisdom. Because to make things like this, with all this beautiful, harmonious, complex assembly that works, you need knowledge and wisdom. So, we are already giving attributes to a thing that is almost equal to our creator of our cosmos. I didn't even use any a verse from the Quran. Even our common sense, our intuitions, our reasons, our intellect is making us to conclude that this is the reality. The next question would be, I cannot speculate about this absolute entity which has no beginning. So how do I know about this entity? It has to come from that entity to me, because I'm finite. That's the role of revelation, that we look and examine the revelation, the scripture, the people who said we are agents of this, spokesperson of this entity, prophets and messengers, we look into their life and we see that this indeed is the messenger who has told us without any corruption or change or amendment who truly our creator is. So the Bible, at one point was a message given from this entity, from this originator, to authentic, true prophets and messengers of God who conveyed it to the people, but people later on changed it. The change we can see in British Museum if you were to go there, how they changed and manipulated the text, added, taken away, changed, you know, added a chapter, taken a chapter out, changed verse here and there. People did that. So we believe God in his mercy, he sends, creator in his mercy, sends prophets and messengers, one after the other, to every nation, so that people cannot have an excuse in the hereafter fulfilling their obligation. Because the creator is just. It makes sense to be just someone who is absolute. Why would he have a deficiency? Perfection is mean he's just. Imperfection is unjust, right? Unjust is imperfection. So, in the past, there were prophets and messengers who came and had all the scriptures, but people corrupted them. The final messenger was sent by our creator. Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Prophet Muhammad was given the final book called the Quran. 
the difference between the previous books and the previous prophets is because there was going to be no other prophet, no other book, the creator has taken himself the role of safeguarding it from any corruption. Because if that gets corrupted, then people will be at a loss. Because there's going to be no other messenger correcting this corrupted message. This message itself is now preserved. And that's why if you ask any Muslim about the Quran, anywhere you go on the planet, you say, okay, read me this Quran. And you would say, yeah, that's the Quran that we got from the Prophet. Memory and in writing. So preservation has guaranteed the text that was given, the guidance that was given, and the message that is within it, when you read the Quran, it says, I'll give you one example, a small chapter with three lines, and see whether it resonates with your heart or mind. It says, say he is Allah. Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is God, Allah, the one, the only, the unique. Allahu samad. The one who is independent, absolute, sovereign, self-sufficient, free from all wants and needs. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That's the Arabic. He is not born, neither does he produce children. Walam yakullahu kufu wan ahad. There is nothing unto him, any likeness or any comparison. There's no similarity or likeness unto him. One and only, self-sufficient, independent, absolute. Not born, doesn't give birth, no families, no offspring, and no likeness and similarities. Is there any way, any difficulty your heart and mind have with that concept? Of course not, because it's coherent, it makes sense, and it's something that your heart wants to believe about God. God has to be self-sufficient. God has to be one. God has to be unique. God has to be independent. God has to be not someone, there's another God who is father, his mother, his brother, his uncle, his, his, his children and his daughters and granddaughters. And if there is one absolute unique God with no father and no children and whatsoever, there will be no similarities. There will be no, people totally unique, no comparison. That is what we believe about our creator. That is what we ask you to consider to believe. So if you believe that God alone is worthy of worship, our gratitude, our utmost reverence, our surrendering submission of our will, saying, you know what is best for us, rather than me just working out and then saying, I'll come in and best and you kill a few million people and then later realize that's not a good, democracy is better, something like that. No, you submit and surrender your will and say, God, he knows, our creator knows what is best for us and the creator tells us how to live our life fulfilling our purpose and how to be saved from punishment in the hereafter if we were stubborn and arrogant by rejecting the truth. Because we are not here as a mere amusement and play. The creator is not someone who is just having a pastime. It, is, it de derives and devoids of any wisdom to say all of this is a pastime. The good and the bad are not the same. How can we equate it? The one who knows and the one who doesn't know are not the same. So we can't judge like that. So the Creator tells us, you are here, given the faculty of intellect and choice. This is the obligation you have to fulfill. If you don't, do you think you're going to end up the same, the same worm comes and eats you, the good and the bad? No. There will be a day of accountability, a day of recompense, in which you will have to account for your belief and your deeds, good and bad. If you did good, believed in correct belief about the Creator, God has promised you, He's prepared for you paradise in which no eyes have seen what's there for you, no ears have heard, something that you will be so much in delight, pleasure, bliss, tranquility, happiness, joy, serenity, all of this is prepared because you fulfill the purpose in this life. But if someone was arrogant and rejected the truth knowing it, they will face the consequence where they will be tortured because they are the ones chose to be in hellfire to be punished. But God says, save yourself. So he doesn't want any one of us to go to hell. He sends prophets and messengers. He sends even inspiration with people. Imagine a, a worshiper of an idol. A dog comes along while he is concentrating in worship, lifts his hind leg and urinating. It somehow stopped him 
from his meditation and says, what are you doing? You're defiling my God. Shouted at the dog. Dog started running. He started running after the dog. At that point, he realized, hang on. Why am I worshipping an idol who couldn't even save itself from defiling? How can it be God Almighty? That was an inspiration at that time from the Creator to saying, this is a false God. This kind of inspiration comes, God gives us, to people here and there. You, people, what they do is, they forego, they ignore these opportunities. And they say, oh, God hasn't guided me. God hasn't given me anything. He's given you clear evidence in the Quran. He's given you within your own lives. In examples in your life, you suddenly you see this and a spark comes along and you're saying, I still don't see any evidence, any proof for God. These people, they will be accountable for their negligence, for not using their intellect properly. Because the intellect has a role to play. And if you did not fulfill the role of the intellect, you will be responsible. So if God gives you a job to do, for example, and you don't do it, you will be accountable because he didn't just simply say, you know what, all of this intellect to discern between right and wrong, truth and falsehood, and you just sat there, you made them both the same. You'll be accountable. So how do we save ourselves from the hellfire? Is by looking at the revelation of God. Because we can't just simply make our life and think this is the way best to live. Like for example, some people do. I will live my life according to the best principles from Buddhism, from Zainism, from Islam, from Christianity. Some people do that because they're a bit, a bit at a loss into how to go about this. They're trying to get best for everything. But no, God, the Creator, has spared us, spared us from this confusion and says, look, he sends guidance, scripture, to a prophet with proof and evidence so that you can be content and convinced of this is how to do. So when I see, for example, the Quran says, when your both of your parents reach old age, extend the wings of mercy. Do not even say oof to them. What do people do? They send the old pal to their home. The people who raised you, the people who, your mom, she fed you, changed your nappies. She bore so much pain bearing with you, looking after you. And when she is it at, in need to be looked after, you send her to old people's home. In Islam, absolute, it's a great sin. God tells us, worship God, and at the same breath he says, and be dutiful and kind to your parents. So much importance. So this message of Islam, you will see, your heart will resonate. It makes sense, it's from God. God tells you, like, you know, all this environment. Would you love God and someone else equally with God when they have no right to be loved and appreciated and glorified and praised? You don't worship your mother and father the same way you are giving the gratitude to God. To God is the only right to have the utmost reverence. Your parents do not have the equal right to that kind of reverence. In Christianity, something along the way, the problem happened by this distortion. Instead of worshipping God alone, there are now two partners. People are giving their reverence to the Son of God. I don't even know what that even means. If you think about it, God has in, having a son. And then there's the Holy Spirit. That's a partnership. God would never forgive anyone worshipping other than Him alone. Because, I will tell you, because God has a right. He created he, us. I'm, I'm explaining, my friend. I'm explaining. When God created us, He didn't say, you know what? You worship Thor, Diana, Apollo, Zeus. It's okay. No, God always told the prophets and messengers, the worship is only the right of God. He gave you life the sustenance to worship him. Don't worship the false gods because that is the trick of Satan. He wants you to fall 
from God's grace by worshipping all this creation, your own desires and so on, because he wants you to go to hell. Because God did not create you to worship a banana or a rat. He created you to worship him because by doing so, you would have fulfilled the test that you are here for. God could have automatically put people in paradise and people in hellfire because he knows the outcome. But he wants us to be here to test ourselves against ourselves whether we deserve to go to heaven or hell. And the way to do that is by demonstrating that we are worshipping God alone and not worshipping a banana or a rat. Does that make sense, Gordon? So that's why I'm asking. I mean, Islam is something for you. Islam is something for me. Islam is something for everyone. Because Islam is the only acceptable religion, way of life from God. It's not an alien religion from Arabia. Islam is not a new religion. It was a religion, the way of life of the first man. The prophet Abraham, Jacob, Solomon, David, Noah, Moses, Jesus, all of the prophets, they brought the same Islam. Pure, unadulterated, sincere submission to the will of God. That is what Islam is. And someone who does that is a Muslim. So Abraham was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. Noah was a Muslim. Peace be upon them all. Because they submitted and surrendered their will to the will of one true God. You and I can be a Muslim by doing the same. By submitting our will to the will of God. And how do we do that? By looking at the Prophet and taking him as a Prophet of God. Because then we know what the will of God is. Because I would not know what the will of God is to submit to. The prophets and the messengers show us what the will of God is. And that's where the role of prophet is. So there are two components. Worshipping God alone. Ac accepting that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. God alone. Allah is a name of this unique God. This name is such unique about God that he asked us to be in um, relationship with. That there is no Allah S like a feminine form. There is no Allah Im where it is like more than one God. One unique name in the whole world. So you know that even the name tells you this is a correct concept of God. And the second part is to say that Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet Messenger of God and his servant. That's the two part of a declaration of Islam. To become a Muslim. It's so easy. One believes in their heart and declares it with their tongue that I witness and testify there is no God worthy of worship except Allah God alone. And I bear witness and testify that Prophet Muhammad is his servant and his prophet and messenger. That's it. What do you say, Gordon? I think the older you, as you get older, I was brought up as a Christian, but uh, the older I get as a teenager, you start dropping out of church. And I don't know if that happens in a Muslim family, or that's maybe more strict. I don't know. But uh, for me, it just drifted away, and I think the older you get, as as I, when I was younger, to following Christianity or any religion, I think it gets more difficult. Some, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think some people do want to find something. But for me, at the moment, I don't. I just find being this. What are you gaining when you become a Muslim, and what are you losing when you? For me, I'm not losing anything. Um, so, in my view, yeah. So, so if you become a Muslim, you don't lose anything. You gain the salvation. Well, so, so a, we invite you to become a Muslim. As a Christian, I would as well. But at the moment, I, I just I've got to what I've been saying is just try and be a decent person, and that's because, as I said, but, but when you say decent person, like who defines what a decent person is? Like, what's the criteria for a decent person? I look after people, be respectful. Um, there's no sort of principles in life, but it's nice to have some people, and if they're not, then they're, well, everybody, I don't know, everybody loses their temper, or loses their way for a minute or so, but that's, that's life at the moment. But to follow, I'm not, at the moment, it's, I think, uh, as I say, that the older you get, um, from a, a Christian point of view, for me, it's like, I, to go back to church. I think, to be honest, I think if, if Jesus or God, Jesus came back on earth and saw that the money that the church has, he'd probably be disgusted with the amount of, you know, the church had so much power 
but back in mid-century and things, I think he'd be, he didn't even have a worshipping place, it was just nothing, you didn't need anything to worship. So, for me, yeah, I think it'd be... Uh, so, that, that's interesting, you've made a very good point. In fact, that's one of the contentions I have with certain religious ideologies as well. For example, there's a Hindu um, festival in which is a giant idol and everybody gathers milk and just pours it over the idol and it's just wasted. Yeah. Um, in Christianity, of course, you've got the, the, the process that the, the, the priests and the vicars, they don't get married. And because you're stopping something that is you know, natural, it's, it's a force of nature, frankly, yeah. to procreate. And when you're restricting that, somebody made a good point. They said, so the best of the Christians are the priests and the vicars, they're not getting married. The best of the females are the nuns, they're not getting married. <laughs> Who the heck is getting married? <laughs> you know what I mean? So the thing is, Gordon, I guess the point that I'm trying to say is, bearing what you've said in mind, Islam doesn't fall within that trap. Because let's just say you were to convert to Islam. Let's just say, let's just go through it. On the spot, all you'd have to say is, I testify there's none worthy of worship besides God, and I testify that Muhammad is a messenger of God. You say the English, so you understand it, and you say the Arabic. That's it. You wouldn't need to be um, you know, put in water, you, there wouldn't need to be somebody with cloaks coming, there wouldn't need to be a ceremony. You could just do it with a you know, broken cup in your hand and a, and an Italian dinner in a bogus bag. It's literally as simple as that, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, because, think about it, if the message is coming from God, and it's God's message, and we're saying that, look, the Quran is not going to be, you know, changed, doctored, and it's God's responsibility to look after it. It doesn't matter what humans do. Like today, if every single scripture was burnt, every single, you know, ancient Abrahamic scripture was burnt, the Quran is the only one that can be written word for word. Because of what Brother Mansour said, it's memorized, it's preserved through a live language, through manuscripts. And when it comes to your connection with God, you know, even as a non-Muslim, you have a connection with God. You can raise your hand. If I was to oppress you, you know what Islam tells me? That even if Gordon was to raise his hand against me, God would hear your prayer as well. So you don't have to pay something to a mosque or you don't have to go to an imam and say, okay, come four o'clock with 30 pounds. No, anybody who's a Muslim, yeah. you raise your hand. There's no even the 2.5% of our annual savings that we give every year. Every Muslim that, you know, their money reaches a certain nisab level, the threshold level, we give it to the poor people. And if we're slacking with that, we're held responsible. You can't just give it to the... Um, the Imams or the Sheikhs or the Muftis, it doesn't work like that. And even the mosques as well. It's exactly like you said, Prophet peace be upon him, is to pray very simply. And you might, even if you're lucky that on your way out, you might see some Muslims praying, you know, just on the side over there, even as you leave the park, literally on a mat. Yes. It's as simple as that. Even if, let's just say that, that bag, because the pr place, if it's a bit impure, I just put the bag down, I just determine which direction is the Kaaba, you know, the, um, the, the black stone. I, I, I used to go to uh, West Africa uh, a lot on holidays and it's 95%. Uh,